everything is going to be alright. Man, just... This is going to be something special. This video is basically um, just a preview of everything to come. And I I'm truly excited about what the season has to offer us. James Harden, Tyree Smackley, and Joel and B together for 82 games. Well, technically in Joel's case, and maybe even James' case, maybe not 82, but <laughs> the full regular of the season, more or less. I'm excited. Like, I know I have my gripes, and I'm mostly been more active on Twitter and on the Discord server than my channel that's going to increase, I promise, but, you know, at the end of the day, I was thinking on well, whether I should release individual videos or whether I have to just put all of the bullet points out there and I'll put them out there. You know, shout out to uh, DJ Efer running back Philly, pumping out amazing content. And one of the content that came out was the four point play. And on the four point play, there was a certain content creator on there who talked about how Tobias Harris should be Robert Ory, and it's like, that's my sentiment exactly. That should be the ideal goal, for him to be Robert Ory. Another name I thought of was Rashad Lewis. That's what we're going to need from Tobias Harris. We're going to need him to be able to shoot eight to nine feet a game, hit about two and a half feet of them, stretch the floor, open things up, because we have... The dynamic of this team is honestly really scary because we've never seen anything like this before where you have a guy in the middle in Joel Embiid who can come in double teams or triple teams and he can even score on them on occasion. But you also want shooters who can make you pay for doubling and tripling him. To quote Doc Rivers from the first time he got in here, the first thing he emphasized in his post offense you know, if we get the ball to Joel, we're going to score. And if we get double team, we're going to score. And I, I agree with that philosophy 500%. I think it's been proven true. I think it's the way we have to attack this to win the championship. No matter what happens, when we get the ball to Joel, we're going to score the ball. And what's also true is in that practice, when Doc was like, your spirit, just because you're playing through Joel, Necessarily that you're that you have to get Joel the ball. Where what I would really like for our guards to be able to do is because Joel is there in the mid and the high block, you know, if the man is playing off of Joel, that's a free open lane. If he's playing up close, he can attack. I want our guards to use the post to be able to attack, dribble, penetrate, get into the paint. Excuse me, BP for a second. We should lead the league in points in the bank. That's what I believe. I believe this team should be able to lead the league in points in the paint. You got a guy like James Harden who's able to bait down the defense. Tyrese Maxey is also able to bait down the defense. And then you have Joel here. We should lead the league in points in the paint per game, period. I don't care. There's not a team in the league who could stop it. You know, you run the pick and roll, you spread the court, got shooters on the corners. You should be able to attack the defense. You know, a thousand ways to die, to quote Brock knows the ball. A thousand ways to die. You should be able to attack any defense with this particular unit. But what makes this unit special, in my mind, what makes those three players, Jerome Embiid, James Harden, and Tyree Maxey, what makes them dynamic together? Well, here's the thing. I, we're going to go down a brief history of big threes. Obviously, Golden State is up with the Beacon Dynasty. But when you think about Golden State, how is Golden State able to succeed? Well, 
Draymond Green is a, and they're going to go away from it. That's going to be interesting when I think about it. Once they do move on from Draymond Green, I suspect that the Warriors are going to be more of a pistol offense. You're going to run more of your offense throughout the huge step. And, you know, whether it be a Wiseman or whether it be a Kuminga, you're going to be more of a traditional pick and pop offense. So you can run it that way and they'll still be formidable. But running the Draymond Green offense is just, he's a low usage guy. Clay Thompson is one of the best off ball B play shooters in the league and step to step. So you're able to run your actions without ball dominance as much. So that's one way you do it. But for us, now this is going to sound pretty lofty. Well, maybe not so lofty, but it was lofty at the time. If you lived in the era when this team played, you would think of this comparison as sort of ridiculous. But hear me out toward the end. The Miami Heat, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh. That team was absolutely formidable. It was formidable in ways and in other ways it kind of underachieved. You know, you beat Oklahoma City, but then you lose to Dallas, and then you're able to come back and beat San Antonio Spurs. And you also lost to the Spurs, so it was like four final trips, two years. And that's why you think about the Bron, Wade, Boss, Heat, and you're like, eh. And they didn't really meet up to their potential. Or ultimately, in the end, I mean, you won two NBA titles. And that's telling you how hyped they were. But why would they a championship team? It is an offensive philosophy that I call the wave in the offense. But what does that mean? Well, LeBron James is a ball handler, right? Like he makes the plays, he gets you into your stuff, and he's able to score and he's able to pass or what other people would use the term heliocentric. But then you also have Dwayne Wade next to him. Like this was the big thing that a lot of us were thinking at the time. How is this going to work? Well, then you have the Wade in the offense, in Chris Bosh. The Wade meaning Chris Bosh, like Clay Thompson. I don't need the ball. I, I can score the ball at a heavy rate without needing to possess it, per se. Pick a pop, LeBron and Chris Bosch. Pick a pop, Wade and Bosch. You know, maybe every so often here and there I can get a post touch, but for the vast majority of it, I, I could just play off those two guys. And that's what made them formidable. Why do I compare this to Miami? And in fact, better than Miami? Miami had one ball. Chris Bosch. I'm not going to call shooters balls because even though they stand in the corner and do nothing, the problem with calling a shooter a ball is that they're not really, they don't really release pressure that much. So a perfect example is actually a 60 feet win rocket team. You know, the idea is, oh, let's get a bunch of shooters together and that equals the Spaff Brothers. Learn the hard way that no, it really doesn't. Like, I've always been of the opinion that this idea of, ooh, just get shooters, just get shooters. We experienced ourselves. When I'm in the 2017, leave the Boston. Why? Couldn't dribble drive. Shooters are valuable to play off of your stars, but they're not balls. They're not pressure relievers. They're just there to be able to keep a double team or triple team from happening, or even if it happens, it make you pay with a fee ball. But they're not consistent enough to be what I would call evolve in the offense. So the Sixers, in our lineup in particular, has two balls. You heard me right. We have two balls. Two players that went or without the ball. They can absolutely dominate. The one ball is obvious, the other one is less obvious. So the obvious ball is Tyree Maxey. What an absolute X factor that this guy has become and what a home run hit for the 76ers. To be able to have a dual combo guard who could play on ball, off ball, 
You can run the pick and roll shots for him. You can get him downhill. You can get him into attack. But you can also station him in the corners, either left or right corner, it doesn't matter. You can have him on the wing. You can have him one pass away from Harden. He'll knock down the feet at a 40% clip. To have an elite shooter like that, who can also attack off the dribble, it makes him not only just a ball, it makes him one of the most dangerous balls the NBA has ever seen. Because normally, when you got guys like Harden and Embiid, you're already focusing the majority of your defensive attention on the pick and roll, pick a pop. Because MB can float out for three, he can float out for the mid-range jumper, or he could just float out the clear out while James Harden is taking you one-on-one to the basket. I know, Harden is finishing lately. But if all works out and James Harden is one-on-one, you just have to hope that you have a better Harden at finishing. Because that's the whole point of the switch. The switch doesn't stop the pick and roll. What the switch does is that inevitably there's a size advantage somewhere. Or well, James Harden is taking some smaller defender to the rim. We just need to convert on those opportunities when they're available. But anyway, all that action, it's hard to guard. Teams, even good teams, even playoff teams, even Toronto had to sink in. You heard Eric Fosa, let's build a wall. You had to commit multiple off-ball defenders just to stop this action. And because you had to do that, Tyrese Macri is able to be the evolve of those two and be a massive off-ball weapon. And not just an off-ball weapon, but one that could literally, he could literally shoot like 10 shots from out there, hit about four of them. Maybe he'll get a couple of layups and all of a sudden you're looking at, I don't know, 20 points on 14 shots when he did in the preseason. That is absolutely devastating. And it's even more devastating than Bosch because Bosch is that ball, as that off-ball ball, it wasn't a floor stretcher per se. It wasn't a back burner. It wasn't one of those things where it's like, this guy is, you know, at that level. You know, it was LeBron, Wade, and with all due respect to Chris Bosch, a little bit off, you know? Bosch as the third wasn't quite Wade, wasn't quite LeBron. And this will later happen with LeBron, Kyrie, and Kevin Love. Where Kevin Love, as the ball, in other words, the guy who takes away from the attention being poured to LeBron and Kyrie, Kevin Love famously in Cleveland took a dip. Many Cavalier fans were unhappy about that. So that's the role of the ball. The ball is the one who sacrifices his stats to clear the floor for your two superior ball handlers or scorers. But I said we had two balls, two guys who can basically function off the ball as offensive threats. The obvious one is Tyrese Maxey. The not obvious one, Joel Embiid. Remember, it's someone who plays off the ball. And this is where the offense has to transform. Romp 2.0 talked about it. Sixer talked about Romp. And, and I'm... 500% with him on this. this. What I'm talking about right now, this is what's going to get us to holding the Levy O'Brien trophy. We need to find ways to utilize Joel and B off of the ball. Whether that be you run a screen and roll, pick and roll, and he's rolling to get those easy shots like Harden said, or he doesn't even have to be involved in the screen action. You know how we've always had Ben Simmons in the dunker spot, put him at T5 on the dunker spot. You know, remember we put Tyree Smack the times in the dunker spot. I would love to put Jerome B in the dunker spot. 7-2, 260 plus, you know, because he looks slim. I don't want to say 300 anymore. Like, it's just a step of, you're in shape, you're in shape. Uh, but okay, 280, whatever. But it is big mammoth of a human being. Literally two feet, four feet in the rim. Who the hell is going to guard him at the dunker spot? Who is going to dislodge this guy at the dunker? Nobody. On the other hand, who is going to stop Harden or Maxi? And this is why I want Maxi to improve at the playmaker. We've seen signs that he has. Who's going to stop these two guys from getting to the rim 
and creating contact, creating initiative. And so, you know, there was that one play where in practice, during that scrimmage in Charleston, where Tyree Snacky was penetrating to the rim or was going to penetrate to the rim, he takes one step and then he kicks it out to Harden. Well, I would, if I were coaching in that sequence, what I would have tried to tell Max is, you want to force the defender to make a decision. If Maxi had just dribbled the ball and took another two steps, Paul Lee was guarding Joel Embiid in that one, you forced Paul Lee to make a decision. Am I going to guard Embiid? First of all, since the whole sequence was, I want to get the ball to Joel, or that was what they were thinking, the bad version of it. The irony is, Tyrese didn't have to kick it out to James to get it to go. If Tyrese had taken one more step, Paul Lee had to decide whether he's going to come up or not. If he comes up, you can throw a lob to Joel. I know he's not the biggest jump, and he doesn't have to be. He has a some football wingspan. He'll catch it, he'll kiss it off the glass, two points. Or if Paul Lee doesn't come up and you beat your man, you can just throw a nice entry pass there in the paint. And there you go. Joel caught the ball literally two feet from the bucket. So just by taking that extra step, Tyrese would have forced so much. And I'm just talking about the Paul Lee John B dynamic in that sequence. What about James Harden, man? Let's say that Tyrese really did want to get it to James Harden. Was there a better way? Well, if you take that one or two steps, James's man is in the corner guarding James. He also has to make a decision. He has to decide, am I going to come and help on Tyrese here? Or am I going to stick to Harden? 90% of defenders would normally just want to stick to Harden. But depending on your defensive principles, the defensive coaching, you may have the idea and the philosophy, and it's not wrong, of we want to keep you out of paint. So the health defender could come over, even from James motherfucking Harden, and be like, we're going to try to stop Maxi here. And here's the Maxi part of development. If that defender came off Harden, then you can make the pass. So the only thing that was really wrong with that sequence in Charleston was that Maxi didn't take a second step. If he had just took that second step, he could have made that entire defense move just by taking that second step. If Maxi learns how to do that consistently and to make that read as a passer, offense is going to be ridiculous because there's so many needs you can get out of that four and one out offense. So many needs you can get from that. And you could put Joel basically anywhere on the floor. You could put him in the dunker. You could put him, you know, to use the butt bound terminology, you can use him on the nail. You can put him on the left block, you can put him on the right block. You can put him in the high post, you can put him in the low post. You can put Joel anywhere on the floor. And you can run any variation of screens and screen assists. This offense is going to be super hard to guard. And it's going to be hard to guard because you're going to have two waves in the offense. Now, what's really scary is we saw in our preseason game, James Harden shooting catch and shoot threes, and he shot them in range. But really, the catch and shoot three is the big thing. I view Maxi as evolved. I view Embiid as evolved. Can you imagine if Harden is able to occupy the ball position in plays where either Maxi or Embiid have the ball for a touch? It's like, if Here's how scary we can be. We can be such an offense with all three offensive players that at any moment in the game, any one of them can get the ball and attack you on a mismatch. Any one of them can catch and shoot, you know, and be especially from mid-range when his feet have been inconsistent. But hey, inconsistent summer for the shooting threes. Like it was 15 years ago where shooting threes from the five spot was reserved exclusively, like shooting fine, that's it. So now shooting 32, 33 percent for three, I really don't mind for that five spot particularly. So you have Joel who can stretch you out, Maxi who can definitely stretch you out, 
and if all is shooting cash and shoot fees, Harden can stretch you out. There's, it's going to be impossible to guard all that. All of that movement, all of that action, all of that off ball ability. They can, I haven't even talked about what we've seen from PJ Tucker in terms of the screen game, short roll, blow out to the corner, the things that he does. The X factor for me, from an offensive standpoint, is Tobias Harris' consistency. One of the reasons the Charlotte game was way too damn close. Go look at that box score. I might be okay with P.J. Tucker taking over the Danny Green role of I'm not an offensive fan at all. But Tobias Harris cannot be putting a zero next to him as well. We cannot get poor production from two forward spots. That's the only thing of concern. I know that Harden, Maxi, and Embiid are going to get 75% of the touches in the starting lineup, as they should. But Tobias, I need you to give me 12 to 13 tonight. You've got to be able to be a fourth option. But where, like, if you're struggling in that role, I don't care how nice you are, Dale, you're going to have to trade them. Because we need that fourth option to be a consistent 12 to 15 tonight. Because P.J. Tucker isn't going to give you anything offensively. Let's call that what it is. It's one of the irky things I had about P.J. as a player throughout his career. But now that you have him in your lineup, you can't have two non-scores. So it's very imperative for Tobias Harris to be a consistent fourth option on this team. To be that guy who shoots the ball. And whatever few ISO opportunities he gets, whatever, I don't like them. But if you're going to get him, you have to knock him in. Because we need 13 points a night from you, Tobias. Bare minimum. Bare minimum, we need 13 points a night. And that's what we need from Tobias Harris. We cannot have what we had in the Charlotte game. Zero, zero. No. you got to give me 13 points. I don't even care about the efficiency from Tobias. I just care that he scores. Because if PJ isn't doing the scoring, and, you know, Unless Embiid and Harden and Maxi, you get like 30, 30, 25 or something ridiculous like that, you're going to need your fourth option. So we need to buy Harris to be consistent, scoring the basketball, 12 to 15 points a night. So that's the starting lineup. I think the starting lineup is going to be great. But if it's not great, and if we struggle because of these two forwards, I hope Dan Moy says, okay, we do need to get a wingman in here. Even the wingman is not great. Maybe tread their line. Maybe some of these teams want to tank, whatever the case is. You know, am I keen on the Harris? Am I keen on the Harris Tucker pairing at the four games? And I honestly lean toward benching Tobias Harris and starting the Anthony Melton. It would give you another perimeter defender. It would give you steel and get out of the transition and run a bit. I also think the Anthony Melton is much better if I can put him with Harden and maybe Maxi doing exchanges. Get Melton off the ball. I don't want to see the Anthony Melton on the ball. He is not good on the ball, but he's good as an off-ball, catch-and-shoot defender. But we were hoping for him to be the backup point guard, and he's very clearly much more of a wingman. Memphis Grizzlies fans are absolutely right about the guy. He's a wing. He's not a guard. He's a small wing. But I think he can play it due to his 6 7 wing span. So I would put the Anthony Mountain at the three, and I bench Tobias Harris. That's just me. But we'll see how the starting lineup works out. But speaking of the Anthony Mountain, this brings us to the bench. That second unit, it has an identity. For the first time, that second unit has an identity. You know, Montrezl Hill, I'm going to have a love and hate relationship with Montrezl Hill, depending on how Doc utilizes the lineups. Okay, so here's the thing, to briefly explain this. You can have a bad defensive player on the perimeter. You absolutely can. Why? Because, okay, here's the thing. Let's say you do have a bad perimeter defender. Well, you could play a zone, matchup zone, whatever. You can have the off-ball wing defender come and help out on the drive, on occasion, on time. You can tag a defender, so forth. There are things you can do as a coach schematically to hide a bad perimeter defender. If we've learned anything from Julio Okafor, people, you can't do that with the big man. 
it's not like a B man can. It's not like the power forward can tag another center because ultimately the the bigs, even if you did that, let's say you switch bigs, it's still a big man, you know? Like, even if Julia Okafor were to be put on power forward, what difference would that have made? And it's the same thing with Mantra's Hell. With Mantra's Hell, what difference does it make whether I put him on fours or whether I put him at five? It doesn't make a difference. So Mantra Carroll is and always will be a negative defender. And that is why I'm going to have a love-hate relationship. He will score 10, but he'll give up 10. And the 10 he gives up is going to be like this, okay? A lot of people sometimes get caught up in whether your man scored. But what about the opposing team scores? So Mantra Carroll, in pick and roll situations, you know, if you're in drop heavy and you're not impeding the ball handler, we remember Spencer Dinwiddie, the team for jumpers. Get used to that look again because that's going to happen. Or sometimes maybe not even a jumper. Maybe I'm just going to take it to your grill because you're backing away. You're not being aggressive as a defender. I'm taking it into your body and I'm going to finish on you. And we saw that in preseason games, you know, because hell is what he is. And that's where the hate relationship for me is going to come in. He's not a five. If we all talk about Paul Reed, you know, some six content creators who I love very much and who bring awesome insight, but one of the things that we disagreed on was Paul Reed's not a five. Okay, what are we going to call hell? Because he functionally cannot play the center position. Right? Flat out, I'm sorry. No. So what does that mean? Well, if you're going to put hell at the five and you know, it's better to five than the four because a lot of fours are going to stretch you out. And we already see there's a reason you're in duck drop deep coverage. Can't really guard guards. So what makes you think you're going to guard some stretch big man, right? But if you're going to do that, if you are going to do that, then it's really important that we put defenders around him. Like I said that it's almost impossible to mitigate, but you're going to have to do it the best that you can. So what does that mean? Well, the second, the first preseason game that we played against Cleveland, Dave Yoga made an adjustment. He put in Paul Reed next to Montreal. And you saw the benefits of that on the defensive end of the floor. Because Paul Reed, with his switchability, with his ability to blow up screens, his ability to be a massive defensive player, all of a sudden, there's a little bit of pressure that's left off Montrez Hale. And that's where DeAnthony Melton will also play a role in that second unit, where DeAnthony Melton's defense is also going to play a role into that. So you got Paul Reed, you got DeAnthony Melton. Daniel House is a functional defender. You're going to have to play all these guys together with Montrez Hale. If you're going to go with this type of lineup, I wouldn't mind it, but I still think if you were to ask me, you know, Sixers Universe, what do you think is the one thing that's still missing from the Sixers orientation? It would be this. I called Anthony Melton a wingman earlier in the video. What do you think that means for us? Much to my disappointment, we still don't have a backup point guard. It's not Shake Milton, guys. It's not Shake Milton. It's not for Concord Mars. Maybe they're able to do so, but the Anthony Milton isn't really, again, I don't want to see it. Hopefully his shot selecting gets better in the regular season. Who knows? Maybe he'll take better shots as the game to count for zero. But in the preseason, he was a wrecking ball on offense, and people appreciated it for whatever reason, even though he shot 35%. It's like, I'll be looking at different things here. I'm looking at a guy who's chucking shots and missing. <laughs> so hopefully, you know, and it isn't even just the misses. There were scenarios where he was going to go one on three, one on four. He was just being reckless offensively. And it wasn't helping the team at all. That's why I want him on the wing. But if I put the Anthony Melton on the wing, then that means that we don't have a backup point guard, really. 
Eh, who knows? Who knows what it's going to be? The reason I want a backup point guard is for two reasons. It might be similar to the Clippers. Montezaro is going to be this heavy scoring being on the bench. Okay, fine. But with those Clipper teams, you have Montezaro and you have Yuli Williams. And we know the Doc loves that role a lot. But who's the Lou Williams here? We don't know. And we need that in order to be one of the better benches. Knock, knock, Jordan Clarkson, right? I, I think the Doc will go to there and be like, yeah, the empty more wing than guard. Because it's just noticeable. The way the empty, the way that second unit still struggled at times to get into the offense. It was just noticeable. And we need a backup guard. So... The one reason is because I want another scorer next to Montreal so we can really take off. Because Paulie is a defensive specialist, the Anthony Melton is a defensive specialist, and then you got Harold, but who's that other guy? I was thinking before we raised them for some stupid damn reason, cap, whatever, fine. Then the Oklahoma City Thunder go and pick him up with a multi-year contract. Ugh. Why draft guys and let them go to another organization? Uh, I'll never agree with it. Even in win now mode, it's still stupid. It's still the wrong thing to do with the organization. Whatever. I was thinking it'd be him. It's not going to be him. I don't think that guy's on the roster. And Doc Rivers alluded to this a little bit, in my opinion, when he's like, well, we have the open roster spot. I think the organization does know that there's a backup point guard problem. The second reason. Why I want to back up point guard is because James Harden and Tyrese Maxey are integral to this team's success, obviously. I think it's going to be the best backcourt in the NBA. I think it's going to take the lead by storm. I think they're going to be surprised. Not us, because we've seen how they built this chemistry so quickly. But the rest of the league, 37 national games this year, the rest of the league, the fans are going to be like, this is a top three backcourt, if not the best backcourt in the NBA. And that's absolutely true. We have the best backcourt in the NBA, and we have the best son in the league. Sorry, yo, kick. But I want, just like we want Jerome B to be able to be rested for the playoffs, same thing with Harden and Maxi. Even though, yes, Maxi's going to be 22 years old, he's going to be, or is it 21? We have a young guard. But even though he's this young guard, fresh on eggs, you don't want to run that into the ground, just like you don't want to run your running back into the ground. And you want to be able to rest them for minutes over the course of an 82 game season. And I just don't know if we have that. I don't know if we have the guy that's going to be able to get a spell for Harding, get a spell for Tyrese Maxey. I don't know if we have that. And that's what I'm going to be looking for, and that's what's going to be crucial. Either it's on the roster, or we're going to have to get it at the deadline. Overall, though, overall, I am excited about the Spark Cup. I think, we, I think we're going to do great things. I think we're possible title contenders. And I think that we're just going to take this thing by storm. So, the game is tonight, 7 o'clock Eastern. Well, it's a TNT broadcast, so just add like 15 minutes on it. <laughs> this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. 37 national televised games. Well, some of those national televised games will also have the local broadcast because the local broadcast came out and they said they had 72 games. So, the national broadcast only gave up 10 games, so I guess that's good. Uh, but, <laughs> I have a feeling we'll end up hearing the likes of Doris Burke more than we would like to hear. <laughs> I mean, she's pretty intelligent, but, you know, sometimes you need the long arms and stuff. Also, I'm still peed two years in a row, you kick over Joel. So, I'm going to hold out against some of these voters, you know. Like, I'm sorry. I know who the best son in the league is. So, I'm just going to hold that on him. But, you know, it is what it is. 
Hopefully the Sixers win and we'll be able to enjoy. <laughs> but we all know the actual broadcast sucks. It ain't a steal, especially as it pertains to Philly. Over under how many Philadelphia Santa Claus speaking jokes are we going to hear? I-, I think about 100 by the time the British coming games are through. Just ridiculous. <laughs> And this is the first of 32 of them. But six of the universe, oh, 37, no, I'm sorry. 37, I don't tell about it, I wish it was only 32. The first of 37, and the first of 82 overall. Let's kick ass. This is the universe. Signing off for now.